What does it mean to be dominant? I've played at the highest level. I've received the highest award. Thank you. But those things did not make me dominant. On this show, I want to interview people from various backgrounds and careers to see what made them dominant. That's why I decided to partner up with Mission Bueno. Together, we want to promote progress and achievement while sharing real stories of struggle and success. We want to acknowledge the challenges in front of us, but we also want to pivot towards improvement and positivity. Everything is going to work out. We are the dominant ones. We dunk on the world. We don't let the world dunk on us. I'm going to tell you what happens when we do air balls. Yeah. You have to run two laps. What? Suicides. Got it. Nah, I know, right? <laughs> I'll go barefoot. Hat on top, cause we think excellent. Frames on straight, cause I see excellent. Dress for success, cause I be excellent. Everything we do, everything we do. Ooh. Hey, Chris, come Hi. on in. Thanks for coming. I appreciate oh, it. Ew. Chris, well, thanks for coming to my home and Thank being on my show. I really me. appreciate it. You know, I see you all the time during the season, and, you know, we always kind of, uh, you know, bumping together. We talk about sports a lot of times, and just about anything that uh, we're kind of passionate about at that moment, but yeah. <laughs> it's always good to see you. So we love doing this show with people because we want to talk about their struggles before they got famous or before they got success successful. And one of the things that I want to know about you is how did basketball start for you? I mean, was that your first love? It was. Um, mm -hmm. I was eight years old, mm -hmm. and I was already close to as tall as I am now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're, it seemed like lady. the natural fit. I mean, mm -hmm. I was this height by the time I was 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. So stood out, you know, uncomfortable among elementary school students. but on the basketball court, that's where I always felt at home. That's mm -hmm. where it felt like a natural fit and it felt like something mm -hmm. that I could be really good at and that mm -hmm. my height would give me an, an advantage in rather than mm -hmm. making me feel like I always got to hunt around right. my friends right. in third and fourth so you, grade. So you thought that in the very beginning that you I could did. probably be good right. in basketball. Well, because I realized this is something mm -hmm. that I can use mm -hmm. to my advantage. Right. I can be the best on this team really early on without mm -hmm. even knowing much about it just because I mm -hmm. tower over everybody else. So it was the first place that I really felt confident in what I looked like and who I was becoming as well. Was basketball the first sport that you was actually comfortable yes. with? Yes. Oh. Um, it was really the first sport that I fell in love with, that I became committed to entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up in Florida, so mm -hmm. They had me play soccer and t-ball yeah, a little yeah. earlier than that, but it is too hot for all of that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> in, Florida. in Florida, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, but basketball was really the first sport that that I I, I grasped a hold of and really fell in love with. So, whether you or was it like family members that kind of pushed you into trying to make an early career, maybe high school or college, with were your family really instrumental in? push you in that direction? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even say that they pushed me as much as they encouraged me. My mm -hmm. mom and dad actually met at a basketball camp. Um, wow. The men's team where he was hosted a women's basketball camp and she won MVP, which she points out often as she tells right, the story. Right, right. And he had to hand her the award and that's mm -hmm. how my mom and dad met. So they loved the game of basketball mm -hmm. and they loved that I ultimately fell in love with it also. Well, now, now I understand why you like basketball. So you right. got some good basketball pedigree in the family. <laughs> yeah, so, that, uh, so that's great. So as you started to grow as a basketball player, when was the first moment you knew that you wanted to play college basketball? I knew I wanted to be around the game as long as I could. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to do something long term that was either in or around basketball. But mm -hmm. even this side of 10, 15 years ago, looking up as a young girl, mm -hmm. there were very few women in spaces oh, yeah. in the game at mm -hmm. the highest level. So 
it's one of the reasons why I think it's such a cool time to be a woman in this role because mm -hmm. now for the first time we're watching women become coaches mm -hmm. and play by play broadcasters and analysts and referees and mm -hmm. and so it's it's a really cool thing and a really cool time but at the time that I was looking up and trying to determine what a career path could look like there weren't very many to be able to look right. towards so did you just you look at college ball as a kind of a launching pad or springboard to do something you really want to be passionate about because it eventually went into broadcasting. Yeah, well, and so I was actually playing in college in the women's games, would shower really quickly, try and dry my hair as much as it would dry, and then go call the men's games. Mm -hmm. And so it was where I first not only continued my love for the game of basketball, but first fell in love with broadcasting as well, because it was almost as though I was seeing it from an entirely different lens as I was starting to, to learn to call games and to learn to see things differently than mm -hmm. I had seen them even playing, mm -hmm. even just really looking at my own position and knowing what I was supposed to be doing and knowing right. how to do that thing well, it was like seeing it from an entirely different perspective than I ever had before. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's when I started to love broadcasting as well. Wow. I mean, so you really never wanted to take basketball from college maybe to WNBA or anything like that. You had a bigger vision for yourself. I, well, you know, the WNBA is a huge vision, mm -hmm. and I grew up watching and loving Lisa Leslie and Cheryl Swoops and Cynthia Cooper and Rebecca Loeb. I mean, I, I told Lisa when I first met her that I had a Barbie doll of her when I was mm -hmm. little that had a little magnet on its hand mm -hmm. that held a basketball. So mm -hmm. I grew up loving those women who really, I mean, <laughs> were the founders of the WNBA. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that I wanted to be around the game for a long time and, and, and turn it into a Yeah, career. and the reason why I said that too is because, you know, you, you, you try to find something that's going to give you longevity. Right, yeah. You know, and, and broadcasting, you can do this to your old and gray. Yeah. You know, if you're good at it, if you're still passionate about it, you know, which in sports, sports is a very short career. Yeah, and of, I wasn't of, passionate uh, anymore about playing mm -hmm. by the time I was about halfway done through college. Mm -hmm. And I became passionate in an entirely different way once I started calling games and reporting mm -hmm. on games mm -hmm. and seeing the game differently. I lost my fire for playing the game, but it's like I gained this entirely new love for the mm -hmm. game by mm -hmm. seeing it from the sidelines. Well, what it does, you know, the, the game of basketball gives you gives us the opportunity to do other things in life because we would probably would have not had those chances yeah. or opportunities if we'd have had another field right. outside of sports. Of so sports is a great equalizer to bring bridges together to give you choices and you know I did the same thing after I retired I wanted to find something that gave me the same type of passion yeah. but I didn't have to work as hard yeah. <laughs> you know? and so yeah. Um, no more yeah, 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 yeah 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 so <laughs> broadcasting was great so and I know that that same thing happened with you because I can see the passion with you in yeah. television Moving forward with your life in broadcasting, your ultimate goal is to be where? That's such a tough question for me, and I feel like I'm asked that question often, especially mm -hmm. by young women who want to be in the mm -hmm. industry. They ask, well, then what's the dream? Because for me, this side of 10 years ago, mm -hmm. exactly what I'm doing now was the ultimate dream. That was mm -hmm. all I could have imagined ever getting to do, and to get to do it, around the game I love at the highest level on our network to me seemed like everything that it could ever be. So to try and redefine what dreaming big means yeah. is kind of what I've tried to do in these mm -hmm. last couple of years. It's it's a tough question. But you know what, you, you're a big inspiration for a lot of these young ladies who want to do what you, you're doing. And so it's almost like you have a responsibility to stand up there with the top you know, women in your field because they they do want to emulate people. Like, you know, when you hear people say, you know, they're not role models or want to be role models, but you know what? You are. Yeah. Because these kids watch everything yeah. you do and they want to be like, they want to emulate everything you do. So we have to be at a certain level where we give these kids a chance to have options. Yeah, and in the culture we've created, we so often confuse fame with influence. Mm -hmm. And I badly want to be the right kind of influence for the young mm -hmm. women watching mm -hmm. for you know the ones who now have women they can look up to that i didn't necessarily have at that age doing this at the highest level in the game of basketball yeah <laughs> <laughs> did you know the 
I wore number 21? No. My entire career. That's why your dad likes me. That is exactly <laughs> <why>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. I still can shoot a little bit. I can't run anymore, but I can, I can, I can still shoot it. What do you do for workouts now? A lot of walking, weights. You know, that sort of stuff. I don't, I don't do a whole lot of running. Yeah, neither at all. The fact that people love you and love what we do. But the thing that makes them love us even more is that personality. Yes, yeah. Personality goes a long, yep. long way. And I hear people talk about you all the time. They say, no, she's very good on television, but she has a super personality. <laughs> and people are attracted to that. Kids are attracted to that. Yeah. And we need more of that. Yeah. Um, you know, I notice when, you know, I see you in the arena that you shake hands, you talk to everybody. And like you, uh, yeah, you yeah. do it. Yeah. I didn't think you would talk to me. I didn't know if you know. Stop I, it. Yeah. Okay, maybe that was exactly true. But you know, it, it, but it's natural, and when it's natural like that, it's easy for people to like you. You yeah. know, and wow. in a lot of cases, people love you. Well, you know? I appreciate you saying that because one of my very favorite memories of working at the arena mm -hmm. um, was one of the very first times that my dad came to see one mm -hmm. of the games I was broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that seems a little odd because you can't hear the broadcast if you're yeah, at the game, but right. he'd never gotten the chance to, to be there and to mm -hmm. be in the truck and to get a chance to see what it is that we do. And so he came up to Atlanta and he was excited to get to come to a game. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking during these coaches meetings that I have, because the doors mm -hmm. have to be closed because nobody can be in them, I don't know what it is that he's right. going to do during that time. So I was yeah. trying to kind of find him a seat or tell him where it is that he could hang. Mm -hmm. And then I looked in to the court, into the arena, on the court, and you were standing there, center court, and I thought, him. That is exactly what my dad's going to do for the next hour because I know that Dominique will not only take him under his wing, he'll make mm -hmm. him feel comfortable, mm -hmm. he'll make him feel like he's a part of what it is that we're doing here. I knew you would do that and sure enough, as soon as I came out of the coaches meetings, there you are at half court still talking to my dad. You know, you know, I, you know, I, you know I, I, he was really a nice guy. Right, the, the best, he was right? a really nice guy. <laughs> I tell you a situation that happened to me in the airport. So I'm in the airport once and I'm talking to this old, old guy and our flights were delayed for about two hours. So we just struck up a conversation. He was wearing overalls. I was in a suit. And for an hour and a half, we talked. And just about life. Didn't even talk about yeah. basketball. And after we finished talking, he said, well, sir, it's really nice meeting you. It's time for us to go on our plane. And he said, well, you're a really nice young individual. I really like you, young man. He said, my name is Sam Walton. We're going to Walmart. I didn't even know who I was talking to. It was an hour and a half. I'm sitting there talking to this guy. But it wasn't wow. the, the nicest guy yeah. you know, I've ever met. I mean, he's just a really pleasant guy. So again, you just never know who you might meet, yeah. you know. So I always treat people like you right. want to be treated. And people mm -hmm. is more important than the position. Mm -hmm. It's what changes everything. I mean, because at the end of the day, we're people. Right. You know? Yeah. And, that, and I tell people all the time, it's because one does something in their life to really elevate them and make them successful. It doesn't make you better than the guy yeah. who's not, you know. You know, there's you know, different things in life that, that changes the way you look at things, that changes the way you do things, that give you those opportunities. Without a doubt. So, but... One of the thing, other thing I wanted to ask you, um, if you had to go back yeah. and tell that young lady who just started in basketball, is there anything different that you would do or you would tell that young lady? Uh, a number of things, I'm sure. But I think my biggest regret is not enjoying the journey all along the way. Mm -hmm. Always looking towards the next thing. How can I get towards the next thing, the mm -hmm. next step, the mm -hmm. next opportunity, instead of just simply enjoying where I was, mm -hmm. so concerned as to whether or not all of this work would ever pay off mm -hmm. or, or whether or not this mm -hmm. love for this game would ever pan out, mm -hmm. um, rather than enjoying exactly where I was in the moment. And that's what I tell young women all the time when they ask me, you know, well, how is it that I get mm -hmm. from here to here? Well, I'm here now, so what is it that I do next? Right. Enjoy right now yeah, where enjoy you the are, moment, you know? You know? And, and I wish that I would have done that better, and that's what I would tell younger me. You know, that next question I was going to ask you, but I think i got to ask this question a little differently. And, you know, like I said, what was it left for Christian Ledlow? But you're still young at this job, young at this profession. And I think you're just beginning to hit your stride. Thank you. 
and so uh, you can do this as long as you want to do it you know especially in this field you know it's hard to say where you want to be in the future right yeah it, it really is yeah. because we're doing what we're doing right now yeah so we're just talking about things we mm -hmm. know about things we're passionate about and basketball happened to be that first love right. so you know, it's hard to you know put a time frame on how long you want to do it or yeah. what's the next move yeah because this is the that next right. move, what we're yes. doing now so I think that's the best way I could even ask you that is how you continue to do what you love yeah. to do I want to be known for working in excellence always mm -hmm. um, I want to be known as a person who sees people first mm -hmm. And I want to be the best at the thing I do, not because I, I want to be better than anybody else, but because I actually want to be the best at it for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I want to take care of the position that I've been handed, the platform that I've been given, mm -hmm. which I'm so supremely aware is given and not necessarily earned. Um, and so when I think about just what I want to mm -hmm. do and the way I want to show up every single day, mm -hmm. in a way it seems like, well, what else is there? But in another way, it seems like, well, everything from mm -hmm. there, you yeah. know, when those are the most important things, everything. What were some of the obstacles that you had to face? Becoming a broadcaster? Actually, early in your life, when yeah. you were the young girl trying to, yeah. you know, get to high school or college. I mean, what were some of the obstacles that stood in your way that you were able to finally figure out to get over around? Yeah. Um, it's a difficult thing when you're that age, a young age, mm -hmm. and others around you can see great potential, mm -hmm. can see potential greatness, mm -hmm. and yet because you're the age you are, it's tough to keep your priorities straight. Mm -hmm. And at any point that my basketball and ultimately broadcasting career was derailed, it was by decisions of my own. It was mm -hmm. by having to take this moment and saying, I've got to reprioritize. I've got to decide mm -hmm. now what is the main thing. And if I keep coming back to the main thing, all the other things fall in line. Mm -hmm. And it's something that was much more difficult for me when I was younger. That's mm -hmm. becoming easier as I recognize well, the the rhythms of mm -hmm. it as I'm older mm -hmm. um, but that was certainly it it was making decisions to derail myself rather than trusting mm -hmm. those that were around me telling me that there could be something great here so Chris let me ask you this question I know a lot of times this can be a tough question mm -hmm but I know you can handle it. <laughs> How would you describe dominance when it comes to your life? Dominance. That is a tough question. Mm -hmm. Dominance is undeniable power. Mm -hmm. It's unquestionable greatness. And I think for far too long, women who have pursued positions similar to mine mm -hmm. Had they been great, it would still be questioned. Had they displayed power and confidence, it would be seen as a disadvantage rather than an advantage. So for me, dominance is working in excellence and paving a way for those behind me so that the obstacles we talked about aren't ones that young women are facing still 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Well, I can actually say, and I'm sitting here listening to you talk, that you find you found a way to figure that all out, and that's why you're at the level you're at now. So, I, I really appreciate you coming, sharing, you know, parts of your life with us. That's dominance.